Hey everyone, welcome to this Friday's uh, local SEO and marketing Q&A session with uh, me, I'm Eric Shanefelt. Uh, also thrilled to have my co-patriots in crime, Jason Brown and Ben Fisher. Hi guys, how you doing? Hey, Howdy. happy Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, we do have the chat function open, so feel free if you want to uh, throw some stuff in the chat. Always some good discussion going on out there. However, if you actually have a specific question you want to make sure that we are able to answer, don't rely on the chat. Use that Q&A button there uh, in the actual Zoom control panel, and we'll make sure that we'll monitor those. We'll get to as many of those as we possibly can. We also have several questions you all submitted in advance, and we'll try to get to many of those as we can today as well. A uh, couple little quick housekeeping notes. Uh, as always, if you want to reach Ben, you can find him at steadydemand.com and at the social dude on uh, Twitter. And for Jason, you can find him at reviewfraud.org and at Kaiser Holiday on Twitter. Uh, again, I'm Eric Shanefeld. I'm with Local Marketing Institute. And if you're not yet an email subscriber, I highly encourage you to go out to localmarketinginstitute.com and subscribe. Get invites to these sessions and other things out there. It's pretty simple. Um, we also have our podcast that comes out once a week, although I must admit I have been delinquent in the last couple of episodes. So my apologies, first of all, to you, Jason and Ben, and to everybody else who's been uh, listening to these. Um, there have been some, some family things going on, and then uh, my video producer is, uh, uh, got really sick as well. So my apologies, but we'll get caught up on those very soon. And then finally, uh, make sure you go out and join Local Marketing Institute Connect, our Facebook group. Just look for Local Marketing Institute Connect out there, sign up, join in. Tons of great people out there. I mean, we got so many different uh, you know, Google My Business Platinum product experts and Facebook experts and ad experts and social media experts. And uh, it's a great place to, to get some specific questions answered for you. Uh, that's it for the housekeeping. Uh, let's start diving into some of the questions here. Let me bring up my my questions and updates list. Um, ben, swords are back. Ben, people are happy about that. <laughs> For those of you listening yeah. on the podcast, Ben has a really wonderful sword and, and a couple of katanas in there too, right? Um, yeah, I mean, right now it's all laying against the wall, but I've got my horse killer back there and I've got about five katanas sitting kind of around it. And then I've got my two latest short swords up there, which my God, they're nasty. And, uh, my, <laughs> and my guitar. <laughs> so ben, 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 Ben's a sword aficionado back there. And it, it does, it does look pretty cool if you haven't seen it in the background. So join us in one of our zoom sessions. Um, so let's go over a few kind of quick updates that we need to go over here. Uh, ben, you had an update that there have been some listings that have gone missing from people's GMB dashboards. Yeah. So we're still in the process of finding out um, where meaning PEs and, G and Google My Business. We're in the process of finding out if this is really a bug or not. Um, if you do have listings which are indeed going missing, not removed, not deleted, but actually you just log in and they're gone. Um, the process basically is, is that you just need to go ahead and pull all the managers and the owners and ask them, did anybody delete the listing from the dashboard? That's step one. Um, step two, reach out to support and find out what they have to say because they can look on the back end and they can see when, like if somebody did remove it, the date that it was actually removed. Uh, and we've had quite a few people come to the forum and say, oh yeah, my listing was there like last week. And when we submitted it over to Google, they're like, no, it was actually removed manually and deleted manually. Um, there is a time frame on this. If a listing indeed is deleted by uh, a manager, or I'm sorry, is a, just, it's gone, then you have 30 days to report this and no more, and that's it. So if it's 31 days, you're creating a new listing, basically. So that's uh, the time willing you have. And um, yeah, just hit up support. And then if support fails, of course, come to the community. Makes and, sense. and also Google does say, you know, as a short gap issue right now, you can at least create a new listing. And then if they're able to get that other listing back, then you can get those two listings merged. So that way you're not missing all your visibility online, even though you're basically starting all over from scratch. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, and I'm glad to report, by the way, we've been having some problems getting live broadcast to Facebook. So even though Facebook reported an error, we actually do have live broadcast to Facebook. And 
auto captions even. So if you're a part of our Facebook group, there you go. Uh, Trisha said she's had some problems with getting businesses merged. So yeah, we all have to be one of those problems. Yeah. That's out there. It's out there. Um, Jason, you said, uh, there's been a problem reported with certain kinds of, uh, Google, uh, smart ad campaigns impacting phone numbers on GMB. Yeah. So we started seeing this, uh, issue pop its head up, uh, back in April. And all of a sudden we're starting to get a lot more people that are popping up. Basically what we've been noticing is that click to call, uh, button on, smart. on mobile. What? The smart campaign. Yeah, I know. When people are clicking on the click to call, uh, a different number is being displayed. And so, so far, Google has told us that it's it's involving this, this way the smart campaigns are, are being set up, and it's a dynamic number that's showing up. However, the issues that people are saying is when, when their customers are clicking on click to call and not the actual telephone number it's listed, it, they're being routed to a completely different business or in a completely unrelated business. So if you're calling a lawyer, you might get a different law firm instead, or you might get a furniture shop. Um, so uh, Google is is currently trying to uh, investigate this further to try and see where the issue is. And is it something on their end or is it something that consumers are setting up incorrectly on their end? So that's all we have. Is this a widespread issue, Jason, or is it isolated? It doesn't appear to be widespread. It appears to be edge use cases right now. We're not seeing it consistently across the board, but but we are see, we are seeing enough of them that it does look like there could be an issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, ben, this one's interesting. You had something about a Google ten pack. Oh, is showing yes, out the 10 yes pack. we've seen the three pack we've heard rumors of them going down to a two pack but now yeah. there's been a 10 pack spotted in the wild you want to share a little bit about that yeah and do you want me to share my screen i guess we'll be the yeah, question. go for it all right so i forget exactly who found this but uh barry did a little bit of a report on it um so basically yeah so if you go and just do a search for something generic like start with plumber it'll go ahead it'll trigger the three pack However, if you go all the way to the bottom and you do something like, and you just select on one of these chips, basically, once you select the chip, now you get this kind of bland map and then you get 10 results. Hmm. It's not very consistent because I can trigger it in Phoenix. Jason and Eric cannot trigger it in with the same terminology in Colorado. However, what I find really interesting about this is in, if you look at it in conjunction with the two pack, right? So the two pack, they're doing it only on mobile. I've seen it a little bit on, I think it, was, it has been a little bit on desktop. I'm not sure, but I think it's uh, mainly on mobile, which is usually where most Google My Business and Google tests. Uh, <laughs> yes, panic. Um, but yeah, so basically um, they usually do all the testing on, on mobile. Mm-hmm. Right. And they do it mobile Android first. And that's before something will actually come out live. So if this is actually on desktop right now, that means it's been a test before. And now it's kind of rolling out. So the question is, is it here to stay? Will it impact the three pack? I doubt that. I I doubt that highly. But it kind of makes sense, right? Show 10. We can stick some ads in there, might maybe. So you might see like some local ads. But I mean, you know, it's, it's just an interesting development. But it's not triggered from a primary search. It was triggered from a secondary search through one of those chips at the bottom. Exactly. And if you think about that, that also makes sense because user intent. Okay, Google, you did not show me. Don't, don't go off phone. Anyway, uh, but say, you know, it's like, well, Google did not show me what I needed when I had the intent there. But when I went for an even larger intent, like near me intent, then it went ahead and showed me a lot of options. So that kind of makes, it makes, a, it makes sense. Makes sense. Does make sense. Um, by the way, we had several people comment on, oh my God, how many tabs do you have open in your browser window? Oh, I don't know. Probably around 40. Andy, Andy, <laughs> uh, Andy Simpson was like on, on Facebook was going, oh my gosh, big, big, big eyes on that. Um, let's move on here. Another one, another quick update. Uh, JB, you're talking about uh, unfiltering a list of GMB reviews. Maybe you could give us some context as to what that is and what's going on. 
Yeah, we yeah, and this is another one of those things. The Google team at GMB is currently investigating, but apparently there's something happening where people are leaving reviews, and uh, the business is either getting notified of the review, they go to check it, and the review is gone, or the review just doesn't show up at all, and so it's just being filtered out, and so it's just it's missing on the backside. However, somebody did do a test, and I gave them credit, so I did a write up about this. If you leave if you leave a star only rating and then go back in and ch- and add text on top of it, uh, the reviews will show. And so the two tests that I did, I did one for for Amy Toman's pet sitter SEO uh, listing. I left her a star rating. It uh, showed up. And then when I did it for Sterling Sky and I left a star only rating, it didn't show up. But both times that I added text, the reviews actually showed up. So. Um, again, Google's trying to figure out why this is happening. Um, is this a filter issue or is this a technical issue? So we'll, as soon as we have some information, we'll, we'll pass it along. But at least this is one way you can get reviews to show. For now. One, thing, one thing I'll add to that is, is that this actually may be working as intended. Um, and I know we say that kind of tongue in cheek, but this actually might be really working the way it's supposed to. Now, if you have a situation where you have a user who has left you a review, you know it, and you feel that it's 1000% legitimate. Uh, You can always contact support and you can tell them that you feel it was legitimate and plead your case. And then if that doesn't work, you can come to the community and give us an example because we do need examples of this. Right. Yeah, we've seen, I've seen a lot of reports that as well as matter of fact on on our, um, one of our viewers right now, uh, Agam Jot just said, hey, that he's been the reviews are being being left and are not showing up. So this seems to be kind of a pretty widespread issue. Although it sounds like it hasn't really been identified, and it, I don't quite understand Ben how you're saying that this actually may be working as intended. Unfortunately, I can't get into up. those details. Otherwise, I'd have to come over there and kill you, Eric. Or actually, I'd just send Jason. He's nearby. <laughs> no, he would just if he if he did share, he'd be kicked out of the program, and he doesn't want to get kicked out of the program. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, Steven asked a really good question about this. Uh, how do you know you got a review if it doesn't show up? Are they getting notifications? Yes. Yes and no. Sometimes it depends. So okay. the user will see that they have the review and they'll be, the user will be able to see the review is there. The merchant will not. And then if you, you know, and even if the, if the user goes into incognito mode, you'll see that the review is not there. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, let's go down in here. And then Ben, this this is, I think a a very important one right now. Uh, something about, uh, longer than average GMB support times. Yeah. So right now there's a banner across all of the support dot, uh, help (laughs) the, the help center. And it's basically what they're, the warning is, is that look, support time may be going up and is probably going to go up. Um, this is because right now, I mean, you've got COVID ravaging India at this point. They also are in a lockdown. So um, as we all know, there's a lot of a lot of support for GMB is done out of India. So, um, so yeah, so all I can say is, is as to ask everybody, just be patient. You know, understand that there are human beings that actually look at these support tickets and those human beings are suffering right now. So um, while we have problems, they got problems too. So yeah, keep our, our, our thoughts and prayers definitely going out to everyone in India, especially those in the GMB support team as well. So um, let's be, be, be patient with them, guys. We'll, we'll do the best that we possibly can. Um, by the way, I'll throw that out for what it's worth. Be nice to support no matter where you're at because they don't always have access to all that. They don't, they're not necessarily the ones that make decisions. Uh, and you will usually go a lot farther with honey than with vinegar. I'll just throw that out for what that's worth. Um, so again, unsolicited advice there, but, um, for, if you've ever worked in a call center or know someone who's worked in a call center, those people get hammered. So, uh, be, be, be nice. I know it impacts your business. I know we all get frustrated, but keep your cool and be nice with them. And the um, same wait, And the same goes for the GMB community forum. We are getting a lot of people that are upset with Google. They're taking it out on us PEs. And basically, I, you know, I've had to, you know, tell people that, you know, we're not going to help them any longer on the forums because they are just being super nasty and abusive. And we're like, sorry, bye. Yeah, that's the other thing I'll throw out there is um, 
you know, things like, like, like this webinar or, or the, the local search forum that, that, that Joy's team runs or, or the Google support forum where the, most of the folks out there are volunteers they're, we're just helping people out because we love this business. We want to help people out. We want to help businesses out. Um, be kind to them, uh, especially at the GMB forum. A lot of those, uh, the, the, the product experts there, they're not even Google employees. So I no, mean, we volunteer our time 100%. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get off that. And uh, you know, on, on behalf of all of us here at LMI, Thank you to Google support. Thank you to the, uh, the folks who work at the local search forum. And thank you to folks who work at the Google My Business forum as well. Um, okay, moving on. Facebook page. <laughs> Jason, now answer my question. Um, <laughs> so this is an interesting one. I thought I'd, I'd try to tackle this one. Jennifer wrote in, I have a franchise with a Facebook page that's showing zero out of five stars and no reviews. But there are six reviews visible in the list. Um, I thought there used to be a minimum of reviews recommendations before Facebook would display, but I can't find anything that effect. Reviews are visible. They're just not converting into a rating. Why is this? Um, there was a follow-up that some of the reviews and the ratings, the rating did get updated uh, on this. So just want to throw out a little couple things about the, the, um, the Facebook reviews, how those work. Um, if you think uh, Google's reviews uh, are nebulous, Facebook's review policies are even more nebulous. Um, but it was, I believe, Jason, you corrected me. It was uh, August 2018. Facebook switched over from a star ranking system, one to five stars, to a recommendation. You either recommend or don't recommend, kind of a binary system. Yet they kept the review ranking system of one to five stars. So uh, not to go too deep, but how the way the, way the Facebook stars work is... They, the previous reviews that were there uh, and the one to five are get merged in with the review, you know, um, recommend, don't recommend. And so they, they look at the ratio of recommend to, to not recommend. And that's how they come up with kind of their ranking from zero to five on there. Um, and then they merge that with your previous reviews. There's other things that are going on there, though, that are more behind the scenes. Um, I actually have reached out to Facebook, haven't got any confirmation back on this yet. So if anybody knows, please let me know as well. Um, but the, the theory out there here, and I think it's, it's pretty well proven, is that first of all, um, Facebook is actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a pending process for certain reviews as they're going through. So certain reviews may not show up in the ranking right away, the zero to, to five stars uh, out there. The other thing that happens with that is there's actually giving more credence toward more recent and more populated reviews that are out there. So just be aware that there's some funkiness that goes on with reviews. The, the number of reviews that you see uh, may not tie out with the number of reviews that you actually see in the uh, physically there and may not tie out with the actual ranking. Um, best defense here is a good offense. Just keep encouraging reviews. Although, frankly, reviews have been buried so dang far. Uh, I'm not so sure that it's, uh, it's too much to stress about anyway. Jason, Ben, you guys have any thoughts on that? Nah. Okay. It's Facebook. It's Facebook. Well, Facebook is still a pretty powerful tool for a lot of folks. But uh, as far as the review management, uh, just keep in mind that that – the way they come up with their star with their ranking from zero to five can be pretty funky at times. Uh, Google is nebulous indeed, Andy. And I don't think it's the end of the days for Facebook quite yet, Donald. It still is the most popular social media network out there by a long shot, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, Jason, here's a good one. Good one. Uh, Jim writes in, what's the best strategy for location versus practitioner reviews? So, I work with podiatrists that handle their reviews. Uh, what's the best strategy when, when, I, when we go to request patient reviews? We've got three locations, five podiatrists. Should I be soliciting reviews for the locations first and then move on to getting reviews for the individual podiatrists or what? This, I think, applies to any kind of practitioner-based uh, business, real estate agents, uh, accounting firms, doctors, dentists, podiatrists, that kind of thing. I'm going to say depends, um, and it's going to depend on the search query because 
you know, when you're, when you're looking for, you know, a, a chiropractor, usually the chiropractic businesses will actually show up over the actual chiropractor practitioner. Um, so, and, but sometimes it could be different, you know, when you're looking at, you know, lawyers. So if you're, if you're looking, you know, so if, if you have like a law firm and then you have a practitioner for a lawyer, you know, there's little nuances that you can do to offset it. But um, predominantly, you know, whatever is the most uh, heavily searched result that pops up would be where I would recommend getting the most reviews. And, it's, and, and when it comes to practitioners, you know, remember the practitioners are going to come and go sometimes, right? So they're going to retire. They're not always going to be there. You're always going to have new staff that's going to be coming in behind the scenes, especially when with dealing with, um, you know, a nationwide franchise of, of chiropractic locations, you know? So that was one reason why we didn't want to set up practitioner listings. We actually didn't set, up, set them up. We just set up, went with the actual, you know, business itself because the reviews will stay if the staff comes and goes. Now, on top of that also, I mean, if you think about it, Google, um, they prefer practitioner listings over the practice almost all the time. So if you've got a bunch of practitioner listings, those will actually rank before the business. Um, you start sending reviews to those practitioner listings, that's going to strengthen them even further. And then to Jason's point, which I think is the most important point, really is, is that these listings belong to the practitioner. They will take them with them with them when they, when they move. So if you're talking about real estate, lawyers, heck, anybody really, um, you know, it's their property, quote unquote. So yeah, it, back to Jason's point, it does depend, depends on your goals. Yeah, I, I would say in general, the advice I give to practitioner-based businesses is focus on building out the reviews for the locations, for the businesses first. The practitioners to me is extra exposure. Again, I'm sure there's always exceptions to that rule, but I think it, in general, I would lean more that way toward trying to drive reviews to the practitioner listings. Just um, that's my thought. Because practitioners, I've also known practitioners to leave their businesses and go to somebody else. Um, but uh, of course, if your client is the practitioner and not the business itself, yeah, by all means, fight for your client and do what's best for them. Uh, I see that there, Tricia. Um, JB, here's a, another one here. Um, what is the best? Oh, wait, 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 I just did the one. Sorry. Here's one for you, Ben. Uh, if you're a real estate agent, should you list every service area in the county you serve? All zip codes, cities, et cetera. So I think this one also applies to any service area business. How granular do I need to get with listing out all my service areas? All right. So the answer to this one, well, okay. I'm just going to lay it out there. All right. Uh, if you're going to list every service, every zip code that you have in your area that you service, you're not going to have enough unless you're in a really smaller kind of town. You only get a maximum of 20 service areas to designate. So I'm sure you have more than 20 zip codes in your area. Um, so that's number one. Number two, cities is probably a little bit smarter. And the reason is, is that if I'm going to search for something, you know, I'm going to search for uh, a, I don't know, a uh, lash extensions in Phoenix, you know, or something. No, not or Scottsdale. I'm messing with you, Jason, because your client lash. Anyway, <laughs> so but, you I was know, going to say, say personal injury, extensions. you know, but personal injury lawyer, you know, mm -hmm. is Phoenix, you know, uh, or in Avondale or something like that. That's what I'm going to look for is I'm going to look for something hyper local. And so um, I would be more apt to say cities. Mm -hmm. If you want to get lazy, you do counties, um, you know. But that, but you never do the state, by the way. Anyway, so um, yeah, that's my answer. Jason, any thoughts on that? Other than the fact that you and Ben both have beautiful lash extensions? Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Kind of what Ben said. I mean, you can do you can do a county if you want, if that's going to cover it, you know. But you know, ultimately, you know, do as best as you can to kind of show Google the area that you cover. But, you know, again, you're not going to rank for each and every single area you're trying to cover. Ben, I, I think you made a great point here. Most people are truly going to put the name of the city in their search query. 
Yeah. And so make sure you've covered your primary, your primary city areas. You know, if I'm doing a search, you know, I, I live in a relatively small community, about 30,000, but we're in a big, large bunch of, bunch of, so I'm doing searches for people near Windsor, Colorado. Right. And so people are going to naturally search kind of near their location. So I, I think that that's a great, um, that's a great, great advice right there. What, oh, and no. One quick thing, wait, one quick thing. <laughs> And, and doing your state and doing your country is a violation and can lead to a suspension. So if you are doing an air, a covered area that is over two hours away from your listing that is frowned upon by Google, you can get suspended for it. And if you still have that set in your GMB dashboard and you try to apply for reinstatement, they will deny you. That is 100% correct. There you go. There you and go. while I'll just one last thing, while service areas today do not impact ranking, you know, there may be things coming down the pipe where service areas could be a little bit more important. It all comes about, about user intent and Google trying to give the best results toward what the user intent is at the end of the day. That's what it all boils down to. Um, Jimmy, here's a good one. Can you embed Google reviews on your website? And if so, how? Yes, there's, yes, you can, as long as you are using, you know, a tool and a plugin that is extracting all of those reviews. So like um, our good friends over at Gather Up, they've actually got a, a widget that goes in the bottom of your website and it actually will, you know, uh, show, you know, several reviews. So it'll be like, hey, you know, Joni said, you know, five stars from Google or Ben said, excellent service from Facebook. So you can actually pull it, you can use these tools to pull that stuff in. What you cannot do, and Google's pretty much already, you know, removed this, is you can't use the schema markup on third-party reviews. So you can only do first, you can only do a schema markup on first-party reviews, even though Google's really not showing uh, review uh, schema yeah. in, in, in the snippets any longer. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, there's, there's two things here. One, it's okay for a business to embed or link to or embed Google reviews on their own website. Can they manually copy and paste and put that in or does it have to be programmatically sucked in? It should be programmatically sucked in. It shouldn't be one of those things where you're copying and pasting and putting it in yourself because that's where you're gonna get into areas where you might wanna do a little editing and clean up some typos or grammatically incorrect sentences, or, you know, kind of help embellish that review just a little bit, you know, remember, you know, just because, you know, it's maybe okay with Google, you also have to be very, you know, careful of what the FTC, FTC says about, about that. So if you start putting, you know, reviews to, you know, make yourself look a whole lot better and you're cherry picking them, then that's where you're going to run into some issues. I got to share something with you. I've just, this has just absolutely made my day. So I'm, uh, I'm monitoring our Facebook page at the same time since we're simulcasting out there. Steph just posted, this is my daughter trying to shush Jason Brown. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thanks, Steph. Um, <laughs> that let is me, awesome. Uh, let's, uh, I don't, uh, let me go in and, and remove her from our group now. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on. Just find out the GMB. Just saying. That just cracked me up. That just cracked me up. Um, but by the way, speaking of gather up, Trisha did ask a little quick question. Is there any, is there anything going on with the gather up Chrome extension? It doesn't seem to be working for her. Yeah. It, um, yeah. There appears to be um, an update going on with Google. So even our favorite one, um, uh, the business identifier from Tom Waddington, that's not working unless you're in local finder. I know that uh, gather up was trying to fix something with the way that you could, you know, get either the, the CID or the, the, or the writer review link. So I, I, I know it's, I know it's, it's been alerted to them, but unfortunately Mike Blumenthal is no longer with gather up. So it's on the gather up team. Yeah. That's why, by the way, as a piece of trivia, Local finder is actually called local categorical search. That's what Google calls it. Okay. Well, there you go. Another, tri another trivia Friday with Ben. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we had UTMs last week. We've got uh, the finder, the, the plugin to this week. Um, okay. Let's take a look at a couple. Of, here's kind of a, an interesting one. Uh, this is from Rusty. What are your thoughts on ADA compliance 
for local business websites? Should there also be an ADA compliance policy statement on the website? Okay, um, I'm gonna go into this one a little bit. Let me preface this by saying, I am not an attorney. Uh, this is not official legal counsel. Please get your own legal counsel, okay. Now that out of the way, let me tell you what's what my, my thoughts here. There's a couple things on, on AD and I wrote down some notes when I got this question here. Uh, first of all, be wary of websites or notifications or ads that you see for uh, scanning your website for ADA compliance. There are indeed some valid ones out there and I'll see if I can do some research and find a couple of the more, more valid ones out there that are really trying to, to help you. But I've actually heard over the last month or so here, a couple of businesses who have run their site through an ADA compliance scanner, they failed. And then a couple of days later, they get a call from an attorney saying that they're going to, that they're going to be a part of a lawsuit unless they apply a settlement. So be careful with those ADA uh, uh, compliance sites that are out there that are going to scan. Um, let's talk just a little bit about what the ADA compliance really is and what it does. Um, so again, I'm not going to get too, too nuts with this, but bottom line, the ADA compliance is just saying certain businesses need to also consider uh, you know, people who have disabilities and their ability to use your website effectively. That's really what it boils down to. Um, there's a couple of types of businesses so uh, there's a Title I, I think underneath ADA that says that businesses who have at least 15 full-time employees uh, and, 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 and aren't part-time businesses, I think it's like 15 or 20 weeks out of the year. If you have more than that, then you are subject to ADA. Um, then, well, uh, there's, go ahead. Uh, well, no, because that's actually being de debated right now in the courts that they're trying to just they're trying to decipher if a website actually falls under the ADA compliance statute. So it's going to be it's still being debated in the courts right now. Yeah, I was going to get to that. No, you're, right. you're, you're right on. I'm just saying right now, businesses that, that have to be ADA compliant are either ones that have 15 or more employees or that fall into a category of what's called public accommodation, like hotels, banks, public transportation. So there is still, though, this debate of whether a website does fall underneath it or not. Um, let me just give you just a couple of basic thoughts so on, hey, if you want to make your website compliant, uh, use alt tags for images. Um, you, you know, where possible, create text transcripts for video and audio content. We, I haven't been doing that here with LMI. Okay, ADA lawyers, don't call me. Um, but you know, we're, we're, we're doing zoom and I'm not charging for them. Uh, things like identifying the site's language and the header and a consistent organized layouts. Bottom line, I think here's the biggest thing is watch out for ADA scams. I have seen this come out you know, recently in the last, uh, three or four weeks. So that's, I think all I want to go on that. And Jason, any more information you got on the, um, you know, compliance of websites with ADA in the courts, pass it on to me. I'd love to, love to keep up on that. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, one thing that people always forget is like your alt image tags, or if you have the videos with closed captioning, but yeah, I mean, it's something that I, that I followed. We actually, I actually dealt with a brand that actually went through that whole lawsuit and, you know, but, you know, we did, try to do everything in our power to fix the ADA compliance issues. And then other users kept going into the website and tinkering with it and causing more issues. So every time we would do a scan, we would like fail. And it was just, it was mind boggling frustrating, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, but this was before, and I can't remember it was, it's a supermarket chain. That's actually, that's actually fighting it and just had the lawsuit dismissed. So we'll see. Okay. Hey, Nick. Uh, no, I'm not bouncing on an exercise ball. I just, ever since I've been a little kid, I've got nervous energy. And so like, I'm, I'm actually just bouncing my legs right now up and down. So my apologies if that was distracting. Uh, but, uh, yeah, colors are, by the way, uh, and, uh, Trisha throw out that, uh, colors are also important on website. I'll throw this out from one who is, I, I'm, I'm partly red, green, colorblind. Um, I owned a sweater for five years that apparently had three stripes on it. One dark brown, one dark red, one dark green. For years, I thought it was one stripe. Then, then I caught it in the sun just right and I let, oh my God, it has three stripes. So, uh, but yeah, there's some challenges around that. But don't go too nuts with ADA. Let's see where things go from this. I have not seen too much around that. Um, 
There we go. Okay, uh, low vision doctor, sweet. All right, let's go back to a couple of the other questions here. Here's a good one that came up. This was in before Ben. I'll let you track the tackle this one. Vic, you submitted this one. How do you handle an address with something like a one half in it? I had a client whose address was 4229 and a half that got garbled in Google My Business to one half slash 4299 and triggered all kinds of issues. Well, first of all, I'd love to know what those issues were. Um, but barring that, so the way that GMB works with address <clears throat> addresses is, is they're grabbing the addresses from, you know, official sources, right? And you can go to maps and it basically just Google the actual address that you have and see what it comes up with for competitors as well as when, when you initially do the search, it's just right under the map. If you put in the address, it'll put it right there and say what it looks like. Now, the way the GMB works, though, is, is how I, and this is a really frustrating part, is that even though you put in the address exactly the way you want it, Google's going to move that one half around. It's going to be sometimes in the front, sometimes in the back, sometimes in the middle, sometimes with a comma, sometimes without. We can see this actually within the API because like when we, we do a lot of monitoring of listings for our clients and we see this, like, it's like literally it'll trigger every single day. It'll be different. Um, I guess the point is, is that without knowing what the issues are that we can't really answer the question. So I would say DM me what your issues are. But I guess my point there with all of that is, is that it's nothing to stress about under normal circumstances. And I know it's also an issue that um, it's actually not a GMB issue. It's actually a maps issue. And I know the maps team is well aware of it. So, um, you know, cause we do see, we do see these issues a lot with New York addresses. It'll be like 112-237 and that caused a lot of confusion as well. So I think Google is, is, is starting to, you know, triage and, and, and come up with better, better ways to sort, to sort these, these number address issues. Okay. Bottom line, it's an issue. If someone's having a problem with the address, continue to get juxtapose, go to the uh, Google support forum, try to get some help with from there. Or what do, you, what, do you, what do you guys recommend? Well, I mean, you definitely need to express what the issue is, first of all, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's number one. It's like, okay, well, what is this issue? Oh, it's messing up our citations. Okay, well, that's not, that's not really a quote unquote issue, right? If somebody can get to the address either mm -hmm. way, it's typed in. That's important, by the way. And you should test that. Go into Google Maps, type in the address one way, then move the one half to the beginning front. Do you still get to the same address? If so, there is no issue. Other than a visibility issue of, you know, a business wants their address to, to look accurate. Yeah, but, so. you know, businesses want one thing and Google wants oh, another thing <laughs> for whatever the reason is, right? Yep, yep. All right. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, the Max issue is, is clients were going to the wrong part of town. Now, that's actually a big issue. Right. That would be a big issue. <clears throat> They're going to the wrong okay. part of town. In that case, my recommendation is first go to uh, go into maps and then hit send feedback. It's at the bottom. Okay. People actually do read this, by the way, and they will send you an email based on what you've submitted. Um, so that's step one. Step two, if that doesn't work, then you want to go to the maps community and you basically want to go ahead and detail out and show it like do a loom video actually that would be awesome loom video would be great yes screenshots you need to grab the coordinates as well by the way um so just do a search find it say this is the right coordinates here's the wrong coordinates maps should be able to fix this issue out which should i say that in big quotes spill over into gmd yeah no uh, yeah the, ma the maps community has got some great awesome helpers over there. So we've, we've got a lot of colleagues that we know really well. So like Matt Wrangler has helped me with that exact same issue and, and fixed it verbatim without any issue. And Just also clarify, Jason, Jason and Matt are both silvers and we're both silver uh, PEs. <laughs> in maps. <laughs> in maps. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, a, that was a gimme. Like as soon as we, you know, as soon as you make gold and one and you go into another form, they're like, hey, you're silver. <laughs> well, and, and, and just to just to remind everybody, Google Maps is a different group from Google My Business. Completely. 
they work, they work together, but it is different. So I want to make sure everybody's know that. By the way, a little side note here. I, I threw out a, um, the, the link to Loom out there. This is actually such a handy tool. There's a free level, there's a paid level, but it's such a handy tool to record things that, 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 are, that are happening and to show exactly what's going on. When I've submitted this and I use this for support, uh, I, I, really in any kind of, uh, of, of business, boy, they, they love it. They love it because it can actually show exactly what's going on. So we'll throw out there. All right. Okay. Let's move on to some, uh, some other quick questions here. Try to, we'll maybe push this into a bit of a lightning round here if we can. Uh, Max writes, I have multiple clients for Google My Business. How do I schedule posts for the next month? Doing it manually is so time consuming. What advice do you have to do that when dealing with multiple clients? Do you have any tools you guys recommend? Uh, do you want me to start, JB? That's all you, man. All right. So number one, posting tools, bad idea. Um, why? Because they're connecting you to your GMB. How come? They get slapped, you get slapped. By that I mean, they get hit, you get suspended. If you want to take that risk, use a post tool that will do scheduling. Um, alternatively, there is a free tool out there from Postomatic. Uh, Noah Lerner created this. And it's just a, it does an OAuth connection, but they're not connecting to anything that he owns. And so, therefore, that's really important. What's it called, um, Jay? It's called a Postomatic. Postomatic. Yes. You should just be able to Google that and find it. Uh, or post-automatic you know, a learner, it, that might get you to it as well. But yeah, that's the only one that I even come close to recommending. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there's all. You can also use, you know, uh, Yex if you're using Yex for citation management. They, you know, they connect to your GMB, no problem because you're using your own Google account, uh, so you're not using anything else. And then um, I know uh, the folks over at DBA platform also have uh, post scheduling. So there, there are some services out there that you can check. Um, again, you know, just because I'm not a big fan, I'll always tell people to shy away from uh, local Viking. I don't even know if local Viking can actually connect with the uh, GMB APIs any longer. Is this the right one I put in the link there, Ben? Uh, let me take a look. Maybe if it's, if it's not. Yeah. Yep. That's it. Okay. Okay. Good. I put, I put up it in the chat. So, so check that out. Um, I, I think the key thing here is I'm not, I'm not as adverse to letting uh, certain third party tools connect to my, my GMB accounts. I'm very cautious about that though. And I'm only going to use ones that I know are strongly reputable. Um, so you, Jason, you mentioned Yext. Mm -hmm. yeah, as long as you know what's going on and how it's being used, you mentioned DBA platform. That's another one I have a lot of trust with. Um, I believe though, even Hootsuite now can do, can post to GMB posts. I mean, Sendable can do it. Sendable you know. can do it. There, there's some other ones out there. Just, just be cautious and know what you are connecting to and how that has access to and management of your listing. Yeah, I, I would just definitely stay away from either no-name companies or companies that have any kind of bad history whatsoever. Yeah, 100% agreed. Uh, this is from Donald. Uh, Don says, I have a GMB that is verified, but does not show up on a citation report. Don, I think we may need a little more information about that. Can you tell me what kind of citation report you're talking about? Or Ben, Jason, do you understand what he's referring to? No. Okay, so yeah, Don, if you can kind of clarify what kind of citation report you're talking about, that would help us tackle that one there. Unless uh, it might be an SAB and they might be running it through a tool that doesn't support SABs. That could very well be. Yeah, if it is a service area business, there are some reporting tools out there that will not report citations for service area businesses. Only if you have a actual map pin business location, that could be it. Um, here's another question for, from Jeffrey. Is there a limit to the number of GMB profiles you can have in one account? And is there a limit to the number of profiles you can create at one time? Now, Jason, I'll let you tackle this one. Jeffrey, I hope you'll clarify this a little bit in here because I'll be honest, my radar is ding, 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 ding right now. If you, I'm not sure why you need to create so many profiles and so many accounts unless you're trying to do a bunch of lead gen listings or fake GMB listings. So I may be incorrect. Jason, Jason's giving us a stink eye right now. 
I may be incorrect. If I'm incorrect, please correct me. Otherwise, JB, you want to give some thoughts on that? Yeah. One, if you are trying to game the Google system, we will not help you uh, one way or another. But no, Google does uh, does have you know ways to curtail uh, the amount of spam and abuse that is being you know generated on on Google Maps. Sometimes they do it well. Sometimes they don't. Um, you know, but yes, there are there are limits into how many uh, account how many listings you can create. Uh, at a given time. Um, so if you hit, if, if you're, if you create, you know, several, you know, listing, upload several listings into your dashboard and all of a sudden you reach an error message, uh, it's best to take a wait and see approach and come back later, a, a couple of days later or a couple of weeks later, see if you can add more. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, Google does, you know, pretty much limit you know, that they don't want to have more than, you know, I think it's, is it a, is it a hundred listings per it's, account? Um, so if it's a standard Google account, so like it's just a regular old Gmail, the listing uh, cap is 99. Technically it's a hundred, but it stops like really functioning very well. It, it, uh, and it gets buggy at 100. So I have to say 99. If you have a G suite account tied to your domain name, it's unlimited. You can have as many listings as you want. Um, if you have an agency account, you can also have unlimited. And um, from a creation standpoint, Jason is 1000% dead on with all of that. Um, the, only, I think, the only thing I think that would be probably different is, is if you are doing a bulk verification account, then I believe you can create unlimited locations at the same time. Isn't that right, JB? Wait, what was that? If you have a bulk verified account, then you can do unlimited verifications, question mark, with an upload? Uh, yeah, wait, good question. Yeah, great question mark. What are we doing? <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah, once you get a bulk account, then you can do a lot of, a lot of great, wonderful stuff um, and, and, get, and get it taken care of that way. Sorry, I, got this, I got, totally got distracted with uh, Susan popping up. But yeah, um, yeah, because I work with, you know, I work with agencies. And so that was what we basically did uh, back in the day is we got bulk verified accounts. And so, yeah, they get to go carte blanche and sky's the limit. But they're also creating, you know, legitimate listings and, they're, and you cannot create an SAB. So forget trying to go bulk with SABs. It's never going to uh, pass muster. So um, Jeffrey did clarify, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear this. He said, actually, uh, I work with a healthcare practice that has a number of doctors. I'm trying to get practitioner listings along with, with, it, with the listing. So it's, it's, it's a legit application, um, but there's just, I guess, they're just trying to figure out, you know, I don't want to bust the limits. I would use and he, said, he said once he got the doctor number account. 10, he got a warning message that he couldn't add anymore. Oh, right. yeah. That, that's throttling. Yeah. That's, that's, that's normal. And that's, uh, and that's, you know, uh, uh, yep. Okay. Just come back. Like, like Jason said, just come back a couple of days later. Okay. So, so it's not necessarily a limit to the account. It's just throttling to try to not create too many listings at one time to, and in another effort to help prevent spam. Yeah, right. it, it, it's exactly. It's, it's more of a trust level over, uh, on the account itself. I think, yeah, it actually is. Okay. So, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a spam fighting tech need okay. from GMP. Yeah, there's a go ahead. wait. There's, sorry, there there is there is a link. Um, you can do a Google search to get a Google agency account. You basically you're starting all over from scratch and applying for agency account. Um, you're supposed to get a, a better sense of support from GMB, but I mean, I'm not seeing any real true advantages to get an agency account. And like we said earlier, we are definitely seeing issues where mm -hmm. listings are disappearing from agency accounts right now. So. Where to the wise? Well, I don't think that you're connected. Oh, by the way, that's my video right there, Eric. I'm just saying. This is your um, video? Yeah, yeah. I see the logo, steady demand. Well, you are a rock star. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, and that's obviously not me. But anyway, so benefits of the agency account come down to this, is that um, beyond the support, because the support's meh, it's all right, right? You can submit like multiple tickets at the same time, for instance. Um, because they're a, you're an agency, but really what it comes down to is, is that you can make a request for instance, mm -hmm. to gain access and it keeps track of all of this in the log and it, and the statuses of it as well. So, and it has to be storefronts only. You can't do service or your businesses. Um, 
You can also make much more uh, logical organization with an agency account. So you can create these subgroups and each one of those is going to get a number. And that I think it's like seven digits. That number is forever tied to that, uh, basically that location group. Okay. So now you, as an agency, it's like if we like, for instance, we have a ton of white label partners. So we'll create a location group for our partner and call it something that the user will never know is tied back to us. And we just give that ID one time to that uh, agency partner. And now every time they want to add somebody, they just give us that, or I'm sorry, they put that in as the user. And then it shows up in our invitations inbox on the front. So we just automatically see that we have a new access to a listing. We don't have to go check our emails or anything like that anymore. So, um, so those are the kind of the benefits of the agency dashboard. I love it personally. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I was off it for three years because we had some colleagues that had tons of issues with migrations, et cetera. But now I love it. Uh, I mean, now I'm using it. I've been using it now for almost a year. I can't live without it. Cool. Trisha likes it too, by the way. Um, so Donald clarified his previous question about his business not showing up at a citation report. He said it is indeed a service area business um, that the uh, so the service area business using a PO box. So that's a little <laughs> lot, lot there. Um, the, the, the GMB isn't found in the citation report, but Yelp, Yahoo, Yellow Pages, Foursquare, and such are. So I think that goes back to the thing that Google does treat service area businesses differently than a lot of those other, other businesses. The other ones, they don't really have a concept of a service area business. They're going to show up a map location. Correct. Whereas Google does have the concept of a service area business. Do you guys want to address a little bit? Yes, yes. The PO box? yes, you cannot, cannot, not, not. There is no, and, and people say, why was grandfathered in? <clears throat> you are not allowed to use a PO box period for GMB, whether you are showing your address or you're hiding your address. If you are setting up a pure SAB, it's better just to use your house as your address and hide it. So you're you're running the risk of Google finding that listing and they do do integrity checks all the time and getting suspended and you will not be able to get reinstated until you actually correct your address and get out of that PO box. So don't ever use a PO box. Yeah, so, so, so Donald, you're, in your situation, I would definitely change your address, especially in Google My Business. Other, other listings aren't as darn as uh, stringent about this, but definitely in Google My Business, change it to... Uh, your actual home location, if that's where it is, or your office location, but hide the address and keep it a service area business. That's what I definitely would recommend there. One and uh, it will not show up in a lot of citation reports because it is a service area business and not an actual address pin on a map. Yep. And one little tip about how you do that, because most people don't understand how to, just in case. And that is just going to Google My Business, click on the info tab, click on the address, replace the and go ahead and type in the address of your home then clear the ad after you hit apply then clear the address um and then it's going to go ahead and it's going to force a re-verification it will force a re-verification yep you're absolutely right hey, just you're sorry. Be in good shape and not with potential suspensions and you'll, so, you'll probably get you'll probably get suspended going from an sab to to um going sab to store from back to sab but so what you'll be able to get back in within usually 24 hours if you have your documents. Well, yeah, of course, there's always that. Okay. Um, let's do this one last question of the day here from Susan. Uh, I have a client with a GMB profile that has no services tab. What's the best way to get this fixed? Services tab, we need a clarification. Are you talking about services tab on the desktop, which it doesn't exist, or are you talking about no services tab on mobile? Right. And doesn't that also apply that the services tab varies based upon category? Well, well, service, services tab, I know there was an issue earlier where services tab was not showing and I thought it was supposed to be showing by now. So if you do not, if you do not have it, if you do not have the services tab in your GMB dashboard, then I would contact support and, and ask them to look into it because that sounds like that might be an issue because it was supposed to have been fully rolled out by now, I believe. Okay. Yeah. And if, and if it does, and if, if support can't help you, then of course you can always raise it to the community. But I think it's also important to clarify the difference between desktop, web browser, and mobile. 
Yeah. So that there are certain features that are available more on mobile that are not available on desktop. And Google seems to roll out new features to Android mobile first, Correct. then to Apple mobile, then to desktop is typically the order I've seen. Not always, but that's typically the order that I see. So there you go. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. Gang, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate you spending your Friday with us. Always fun. Always love, love the chat. Love the community here. Uh, on behalf of Jason, Ben, and myself, wish you guys an absolutely wonderful weekend. Ben, JB, I hope you guys have a great weekend too, my friends. Hey. Bye, everybody. I'm going to mute myself. Have a wonderful weekend.